so let's do the sermon, which, by the way, I didn't know it was Mother's Day when I wrote the sermon. So I figured out it was Mother's Day somewhere around Thursday when I was like, oh, man, I need to send my mom a present on Amazon. So I did the two-day shipping with Amazon, and it didn't get there. So good job, Drew. You're a good son, and thank you, Amazon. Glad we pay for Prime. All right. Yeah, it's good. They're like, it'll be there Tuesday. Well, that's not Mother's Day. That's not Mother's Day at all. We good back there? All right. Speaking of not Mother's Day. Uh, so in the early church, to be a good Christian meant to be a bad Roman. Uh, it's, just, it's just pretty simple. To be a good Roman meant you honored the gods. It meant you served in their military. It meant that you uh, paid homage to the king. And the early Christians, I mean, they just wouldn't do any of that. They had no interest in fighting uh, at all. But specifically, they had no interest in fighting for an empire that they saw as wicked and evil. Uh, they also had no interest whatsoever in paying homage to a king who claimed to be, you know, a son of God or, or whatever. That wasn't a thing they were into. They definitely were not into paying homage to the Roman gods. It was just a real problem for them. And so they just said, no, we're opting out on all of it. We will be completely different than this culture. We'll be completely different than, than, this, than the people of this world. And that'll be just what it is. And so that led to, as we've discussed uh, a, a great many times, um, you know, persecution. It led to, at different times in, in the history of, of Rome and the history of the church, uh, things really going poorly. But about 300 years after the church, things went from, it, it goes poorly to, well, somebody decided that he had enough. His name is Domitian. Domitian decides um, that he is, uh, no, his name's not Domitian, his name's Diocletian. That's mm, the that's problem with persecution. Domitian was the guy at the end of the first century. Diocletian's the guy 300 years later. I'm sorry. That one's on me. Forgive me for that. His name's Diocletian. Diocletian decides he's just done. Like, we don't want, we don't want uh, Christians anymore. So he says, empire-wide that being a Christian is completely illegal. And he says that basically everyone must pass a test of purity in order that uh, they show that they are a good Roman and not a good Christian, and everyone must make a sacrifice to the Roman gods. Around that time... It, things it, it, it was it was it was it was an issue right so uh, you get further past like the original you know aim of anything like in the early early church like the very first century everyone like those guys all saw jesus like they all like they were just so close to it they were willing to face whatever persecution but you add 300 years to it and we're you know fourth fifth sixth generation now of of christians and some of them were not quite so willing to die for their faith because, well, why? Like, you, know, just, you know, we can just lie. <laughs> just lie, and it's fine. I'm sure God will be fine with it. And so a lot of Christians during the, the Diocletian persecution decided, we'll just quit. We'll just we'll make the sacrifice. We'll honor the king. We'll do what we need to do, and, and we'll just survive that way. Well, regardless, uh, there was a man uh, by the name of Romanus. And Romanus looked at the situation and realized, this is not good. I don't want, you know, the, our, our faith is going to fall apart. It's not going to work. If, if we are a faith that is supposed to follow Christ and Christ only, that Jesus is the Lord of all things, that he is the King of kings, Lord of lords, he is God in the flesh, he is all the stuff, you can't have that and also worship the Roman gods. And so he begins to preach. He's a deacon in, in a place called Antioch. And he begins to preach and teach and do absolutely everything he possibly can uh, to try to encourage people to stay faithful, to stay true, to, to hold on to their faith, and to do the right thing. He does everything he can to try to do this. And so one day he realizes that he needs more than just words. He needs more than just preaching. He needs more than just teaching. He needs to really kind of put his life where his mouth is. And so there was this festival that was coming, this, this, this pagan festival, this, uh, this festival of, of the gods that was coming to Antioch. And there was a, a, a Roman king by the name of Galerius. And Galerius was going to be there. And the, the, um, the pagan you know, worship was going to be there. This whole festival was going to be here. And Romanus decides, I'm going to go to this festival and I'm going to stir up some trouble. That was really his whole plan. 
<laughs> was I'm going to go and stir up some trouble. He went and uh, he basically, in front of everybody, he goes ahead and announces that he's a Christian. He announces that Christians are everywhere. He announces, I'm not going to fight for you. I'm not going to worship your, your, your gods. I'm not going to do anything at all. I'm just going to be myself, and there's nothing you can do about it. He begins to criticize everybody. He criticizes like specific gods, specific practices, specific things that are going on. He 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 just I mean he just basically picks a fight with all of Rome with one of the kings of Rome just sitting there. And it goes about as well as you might expect. He ends up arrested. <laughs> he ends up tortured. He ends up killed. Um, and as a martyr, now that is the story of Saint Romanus. Now, for those of you guys who have listened to me preach for a while, um, you probably recognize that story. I haven't told it before, but I've still told a whole lot like it <laughs> because I really love the stories of the saints. Um, I'm sort of a sucker for these old stories. Um, I, you know, there's sort of a familiar beat, right? You've got, like, the persecution. You've got the government, you know, doing that. And, 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 and then you've got, you know, fo- somebody that's like, hey, I'm going to stand up to the powers that be, and I'm going to pick a fight with somebody I can't possibly defeat. And then they end up dying. But, you know, obviously we win. Like, we're not talking, like, you guys had never heard of Galerius. I never heard of Galerius. You know, Rome fell, and yet Romanus is a saint, and, you know, that's where we're at. Like, the church survived uh, because of these people being willing to do that. I love these stories. But if I'm honest, I promise you tonight, you're going to forget that guy's name. I promise you. Like, you'll be, like, maybe you'll remember, like, well, you know, Drew got the, the emperor wrong. That was funny. Like, you might remember that. Uh, you, you might be like, it was sort of like the Easter story, but it was one guy instead of 40. Like, you might remember that. But if I'm just being honest, no disrespect to say it, Romanus, but uh, it's kind of a story in, this, in a sea of similar stories. I tell you this story this morning because, well, uh, as, as it turns out, St. Romanus has a little wrinkle to his story that's a little bit different. And that wrinkle is in the form of another saint that is part of the story. As it turns out, Romanus did not go to this festival by himself. He took a dear friend and brother in Christ with him by the name of Brulus. He took Brulus with him. And as he was being arrested, uh, Romanus decides he's going to play a little game. He thinks it's going to be funny to sort of set up Galerius, to set up this king and have this king, you know, have this conversation and sort of humiliate himself in the middle of all of this. So he says, as he's being arrested, as he's being, you know, hit, beaten, whatever, he says, hey, Galerius, there's my friend Barulus. Why don't you ask him what he thinks of all of this? And, of course, Galerius is not a bright person. Because you, you should be able to sniff that setup from a mile away. Galerius does not sniff the setup. He's like, oh, I wonder what this guy's going to say. And so he asks Barulus in front of everybody, his whole crowd, hey, what do you think of everything? And Barulus says, well, I'll tell you what. Tell you what. Your gods that you are um, right now offering a sacrifice to, they're not gods at all. They're demons, turns out. Also, they're not even good demons. Like, it'd be one thing if your demons could, like, make stuff and create worlds and, you know, like, if they didn't have any power, but your demons don't make anything. They just sort of sit there and you worship them for no reason. You guys are really terrible at this religion thing. And then they arrested Burulus and executed him and tortured him and all of that. The reason that's significant, though, is as it turns out, Burulus is sort of a unique figure in church history. Because Burulus was seven years old. He was seven now, what, what grade is that? Is that second grade? Second grade? He was a second grader. So Romanus took his second grade friend. Don't worry, his mom chaperoned. She watched the whole thing. That's true. That's in the story. <laughs> she takes his second grade friend, his seventh, seven-year-old friend, and uses him in a setup to humiliate this Roman king. And it works. It's hilarious. And then the seven-year-old is beheaded. 
I told you I didn't really plan this very well for Mother's Day. I told you I didn't do that. <laughs> Not a thing I did very well. The mom was there. She was there, and she got his remains. She buried him. So it's, she was also really proud of him, as it turns out. So that was cool. That's a cool part of the story. But regardless, regardless, St. Burles is unique because he was seven. And if you just heard me tell a story about a seven-year-old martyr saint, you know, kid who gets beheaded in 300 AD, you probably have some questions. But here's a question that I think we need to ask, and it's just very simple. When did Berulus become a Christian? Like, he's seven. And this kid's not, like, a little bit of a Christian. Like, he's not, like, he's the sort of Christian that's willing to die for his faith. Like, they had planned this. very obvious. Like, this was all a setup. He was totally cool with this setup, going to this festival, literally willing to die for his faith. He's seven years old. Like, when did that kid become a Christian? When did that kid come to faith? When did that kid have an idea of Jesus? When did that kid do any of that? Because, I mean, that's a pretty crazy situation when you think about it. When does Berulus come to faith? A good question. And it's a question I have an answer to, as it turns out. He didn't. Berulus never became a Christian because Berulus was never not a Christian. By that time in church history, we already have infant baptism. And Berulus was baptized as a baby. From the moment that he woke up, from the moment that he was aware of his surroundings, he was a Christian, and he just was. Berulus did not, ch did not choose his faith. That mother who, uh, you know, that sounded hostile. His mother, that mother, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that at all. His mom, who like went with him and you know buried him and all like, she's the one that made that choice. She had a baby, and then in a world where Christianity is a cult, Christianity is persecuted, Christianity is all these things, she said, I'm going to baptize my baby, and my baby will be one of us. And that's what she did. Now, this was a change in church history. Change, it's really important we understand what happened with, with church history, okay? So, in the New Testament, baptism is a, is, a very, is a very singular event. Baptism is a choice that someone makes. In faith, and in a, with a repentant heart, to say, I want to sign up to be a Christian, to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. From the very first baptism in the New Testament, uh, even with John's baptism, that's what it is. Even before Jesus does any, even before Jesus comes on the scene, that's what baptism is. It is a choice in faith and repentance to live a certain life. It's a commitment to live a certain life. It's a line in the sand. And as Christians, as we look at baptism in the New Testament, what baptism really is, is somebody deciding, I'm going to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. I believe in Jesus. I will change my heart and change my mind and change my life. And just as Christ was buried and raised from the dead, I want to symbolically be buried and raised from the dead because I want to be with Christ. It was in the New Testament universally, universally, a choice that people make, which allows for just about anybody, but definitely not babies. Like, the one group of people that can't make a choice would be babies. That's the New Testament. Now, there's a couple of verses in the New Testament that talk about, like, household baptisms. And a lot of times people will look at that and say, well, maybe that includes babies. The problem is, with that perspective, the problem is that, well, the earliest extra biblical writings, meaning the earliest Christian writings that aren't in the Bible, tell us directly that's not what that is. <laughs> that everyone who is baptized, everyone, 100% of them, must actually have faith, repentance, and they actually say must go through a period of fasting and prayer to make sure they're ready for it. The earliest non-Bible version of baptism, the, the, where they say this is what baptism is, always includes self-reflection of a person of faith. It's a decision you're not supposed to go into lightly. So first century, everything in the Bible, definitely a choice people make. We know that because in the second century, early second century, that's exactly what we're told. 
But then something changes. Something changes. By the, by the end of the second century, you have infant baptism happening. And it's interesting because one of the earliest, we know it's not completely universal because one of the earliest references we have to infant baptism is a guy saying, I wish we wouldn't do this. <laughs> like he's saying like, we're baptizing babies right and left all over the place now. I wish we wouldn't and here's why. But he was telling us that they were doing it. So we know it was happening. And by the end of the, the third century, it's now you have fewer and fewer voices arguing against it. Uh, by the time our good buddy Barula shows up, there's virtually no one arguing, arguing against it. They would baptize adults, you know, kids, teenagers, uh, and babies alike. And that's sort of the way that the church has, has evolved. Now, how much do I want to say? This is the sermon that's hard for me. We mentioned this on a Wednesday night a couple weeks ago. Uh, like this is last week was easy. Like I, you know, the week before it's easy. Like most of the stuff, like I, you know, whatever. Like I'm good with. But I feel like we all have these things that are like personally important to us in our in our faith. Like there's certain doctrines, certain ideas that are very important to us. Whether you know there's a good reason for it or not, there just is. You know, we just we're, we I dig that or you dig that, and that's just the way it is. For me, baptism is a very important thing. Uh, it just is. One of my very first tattoos was the date of my baptism on me. Um, I remember I was 12. I, I was young. I knew virtually nothing about anything. I mean, I know virtually nothing about anything now, but, like, I knew even less about anything when I was 12. But I do remember sitting down with uh, with a, a pastor at my church, and I remember the conversation. I remember it super well. Like, we sat down, and he's like, look, this has got to be your decision. It's not your parents' decision. It's not the church's decision. This has got to be your decision because you're going to grow up, and you're going to leave home. And if you don't want to be a Christian, then you don't have to be a Christian. This is your decision right now. And if, if you're not ready for it, don't make it. I don't care. <laughs> We're thinking, I'm, like, I, she's like, I'm not bothered if you're not going to make this decision. If you want to make it, though, it's got to be your choice. And I, that, I remember distinctly that being such an impactful thing in my life. And, and I got to tell you, um, I, 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 there have been times in my life over the last 25 years where I kind of wanted to quit on Christianity. And if you don't know why, well, I'd like to invite you to revisit the last 25 years of this country and the church. And there have been times when I'm just like, I, um, I, I think I want to be out on this. And one of the things that's really stuck by me is, you know, I see that tattoo on me. And, I'm like, and it's not just the fact that it's a tattoo. I have lots of, I've got a lobster on my back, guys. I don't care. Like, I got some dumb tattoos. All right. Just, man, I, I, I've done some, I've made some mistakes. All right. It's fine. It's fine. I enjoy it. But like, you, you see it and you're like, yeah, I made that choice. Like, you know, it's, I made that commitment, and this is it. This is who I am, and so I got to figure it out. I got, I got, I got to work through that doubt. I got to work through those questions because I made that choice. Baptism is very important to me personally, and as a church, you know, this is just we have chosen. Uh, while many, many churches um, have chosen the the end of the second century route of like they just started baptizing babies right and left, uh, we have chosen to go uh, just a little before that and just say we're going to stick in the first century and we're just going to baptize people who choose it. And ma they can be, you know, six, seven, eight years old. You know, they can be kids, but they need to at least make that choice themselves. That's very important to me. And so it's, I wish I could just say, like, well, we'll just say the, the people who baptize babies are wrong and just, you know, here's the invitation. Have a good day. Like, I would love to do that. Like, there's a huge piece of me that wants to do that. But I said we were going to do this series. I said we were going <laughs> to. And I know that the last couple weeks have been important to people, and the next couple weeks will be important to people. And we'll do the important one to me, too. I got to learn, too. In humility... And in respect for others, I need to learn that I'm not the only Christian, that they are also Christians. They have good reasons for what they do, and we can learn from them too. So this morning, we're going to learn, we're going to just ask the question, what do we learn from all this? What can we learn from our brothers and sisters in Christ who baptize babies? And to start, we just need to remember that uh, 19 comes after 18. I know, that's the hard-hitting analysis that you come to church for. You're like, I wonder what number comes after 18. Like if you woke up this morning, you're like, what number is that? I'm telling you it's 19. It's math. It's not even math, it's just counting. It's not even math. 
counting. Barulis. Barulis <laughs> knew that 19 came after 18. Maybe. Probably not. I don't know. I don't know. He's very young. He didn't know anything. Here's why that's important, okay? It's important because, well, we have two different stories in the, the, the New Testament um, that people who baptize babies always point to. Always, always, always. And they're sort of fascinating when you think about what's going on and why it's so important that we at least prioritize our theology and our, our world and the way we look at people the way that people who baptize babies do. Here's what I mean. This is what we read in Matthew chapter 19. It goes like this. It says, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so that he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and he blessed them before he left. This passage is really rather stunning if you think about it. It's really a rather stunning thing. Because, look, look, Jesus, like, at this point, Jesus has, he's, like, raised the dead, all right? Like, Jesus has, uh, he's conquered demons. He has calmed storms. Like, he's fed 5,000 people and then fed, like, 4,000 people. Like, he just keeps feeding people. It's just a whole thing. Like, Jesus, you, if, if you were to come to Jesus and ask him for something, really, the world is your oyster. You can ask Jesus for anything. One of Jesus' disciples literally comes to Jesus at one point and says, hey, can I have the chief seat in the kingdom of heaven? Can I be the right hand of heaven? heaven like that's a pretty crazy request you can request just about anything from jesus because he has shown he can do just about anything and all these parents want is for jesus to bless their kids that's it like pray for them say a nice word put his hands on them something just be nice just be kind and that begs a question. Why do the disciples scold these parents for such a simple request? Like, what's their problem? <laughs> Why are they not just like, oh, like, do they just really hate kids? They're just super annoyed by like, oh, my gosh, that kid, he's noisy, smells bad, his hands have peanut butter and jelly on him. Like, I, nobody gave him a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for like a month, and that kid's got jelly in between right here in the webbing of his hands, and he grabs my hand, and now I'm sticky, and I'm going to be sticky for the next six months. Like, is that it? What was their problem? The answer is they don't have a problem. They have no problem at all, even a little bit. They're just normal. You see, here's the deal. We don't like saying this, but throughout history, people have not liked kids. It's not even so much they don't like them. You look in the ancient Roman world during the Roman Empire, they just don't get attached to kids until later. And that makes sense because we know through history and through records that roughly 50% of all children die before their 10th birthday in the Roman Empire. If you've got a 50% mortality rate before they get to like middle school, you're not getting attached to that kid. You're just not going to do it because you can't take that emotionally. And so what happens is in the Roman Empire, and, and of course the Roman Empire was, by the way, the most advanced empire in the world at the time. So if they're at 50% mortality rate, what do you think the people that are less advanced are? I'll give you a hint. It's not higher. <laughs> like, the, 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 you know, Rome, was, Rome was it. They were the good ones, and they were at 50%. It may be 75 80% in other places. It's just, it, it's just that simple. One of actually, as we talk about, you know, life expectancy of, a, of ancient people, it's not that ancient people didn't live to 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. It's that they had to get to 10 first. If you get to 10, 60 is no problem. It's just getting to 10. Because, like, you know, like, if you guys have kids, like, you see a baby and that baby gets a little fever and you give them a little, like, baby Tylenol or aspirin or whatever, they didn't have that. A fever just kills a baby in the year 224, you know? Like, the baby's just dead. Sorry. And so they just stopped caring. They just stopped getting invested. It's not just Rome either. For the disciples specifically, they actually came from a culture that made it a little bit worse. I don't want to disrespect the Bible. And I don't want to ask difficult questions exactly about the way in which we read the Old Testament. So I'm just going to throw some stuff out here, and here's what I want you to do. Don't think about it. Just accept what I'm saying. 
I never say that, but for the sake of like, this could get off the rails real quick. You guys do realize that story of uh, the Exodus ends with all the firstborn kids in Egypt dying and nobody seems to care even a little bit? Just like, yeah, the babies are dead. That's fine. Nobody seems to question that, like, at all. There's Bible verses that are like, here's what we're to do. If you're a parent and you sin, we're to go ahead and make your kids pay for your sins. You're going to do that. I mean, who cares? There's kids anyway. What's the matter? Like, you do realize that, like, there's, a, there's, a, there's massive swaths of Scripture where it describes, like, yeah, just, we're just going to sacrifice babies to these, you know, these deities. Like, what's going to do that? Going to church, taking my baby, going to kill him. Singing my song, getting the altar, here's my killing knife. Nobody seems to blink. Nobody seems to worry about it. You go into a place in the battle, what do you do? What's the first thing you do? You kill all the babies. Smash them against the rocks. Can you guys know that in the Old Testament there's passages where it talks about eating babies? It's just the world they lived in. Babies and kids are just sort of kind of people. They'll be people one day. But at this stage, we don't care. Kill them. Who cares? That's what we'll do. And before we get mm, arrogant about, well, we're just so much better. Did you know that, like, we started having child labor laws in this country? We started that attempt in 1900. 1900. I told a story last week about the Pentecostal church's uh, origins. That was 1900. We have, we have had people trying to get kids out of minds as long as we've had a Pentecostal church and no longer. Wait, actually, that's misleading because we started in 1900, but we don't actually pass any laws with any teeth until 1938. Which means in 1937, you could go ahead and send your kid down a mine. Or to work at a factory. They have small hands. They can put their hands in the gear. That's fine. In 1937, you can do that. Like, some of us have grandparents who were alive then. Maybe those are their jobs. You know what was the problem between 1900 and 1938? There's all this resistance to these new laws. You know where that resistance came from? You're not going to believe this. It was Christians. You know why? Well, the government can't tell me what I can do with my baby. I got freedom. I got rights. My kid, my choice. If I want to sit him down on mine, government can't tell me what I can't do. Everything I just said is true, by the way. Like, not even beginnings of, of uh, me making a joke. People don't care about kids. We've never cared about kids. I would argue we still don't all that much care about kids. We've never cared that much about kids. This idea of just get the kids out of here, I don't care. Jesus, you got better stuff to do than pray for a kid. The disciples were normal, and that's why they did what they did. But here's what's important. 19 comes after 18. And here, this at least, it blows my mind. Blows my mind. <laughs> here's what we read. We just read that passage in, in chapter 19 of Matthew about them like, ah, get the kids out of here. Scold the, they scolded the parents. What a crazy, what a crazy word. We scolded the parents. This is Matthew 18. This one's fun. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. I'm sorry, I got to read that sentence again. Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. If you're familiar with Jesus, you'll notice that last sentence is not a thing he generally talks. Like, it's not how he talks. Jesus is not usually like that. Jesus is using this crazy hyperbolic statement about, like, it would be better if you weren't even born or whatever, because he's trying to make his point of that's how serious I am. Jesus said to welcome a child is literally to welcome him because the greatest in the kingdom of heaven are children. That's chapter 18. And in chapter 19, some parents come along and say, we've got some children for Jesus, and the disciples scold them. I don't want to give 
too much grief to the disciples. They're not very good at life. But the question is this, are we any better? I mean, I don't want to say a show of hands, but I bet if I said show of hands, who is read, who is, who, who, for who in this room is Matthew 18 new? I bet no hand goes up. We've all heard the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is a child. We've all heard that if we welcome a child in Christ's name, we are welcoming Christ. Is that how we live? Do we really see children as that important? Is that how we spend our money as a church, as Christians, as a community, as a nation? Is that what we do? Or are kids like, I don't know, like 14th on the list, and that's just that. Here's what I love about the people who baptize babies. Here's what's wonderful about them. They took the most important right in the New Testament, and they said, we're going to change it. Because we believe what Jesus said is real. Jesus said the most important people in the kingdom of heaven are kids. So, if that's true, we will take this right and we will change it. Now, I disagree with that. Please don't misunderstand. Please disagree. I'm pretty sure we can, we can live our lives with children as the most important things and recognizing how important they are and also keep baptism the way it was always supposed to be in the beginning. I believe that, but I appreciate the effort. <laughs> I appreciate the priorities. I very much so appreciate that people who disagree with me on baptism are setting an example for me on how we treat children. Who is the most important? And that leads me back to Barulis. There's a couple things I love about the story. Let's start here. We have a seven-year-old saint. That's crazy. I mean, we just talked about, like, what's in the Old Testament, right? We just talked about how it was in, in ancient Rome. We just talked about, like, in our own country, like, sending kids down mines and not caring. Like, we just talked about all that, right? In our faith, in Christianity, we honor as a saint a child who has not reached third grade doesn't know long division yet. That's pretty cool. That's recognizing that there is no one who is unimportant in the kingdom of heaven. That is recognizing that the greatest are the humble. And that is our job to care and protect for the vulnerable. But also, Barulus dies. And I think so often we think about kids, we think about, oh, we just have to protect them. But see, that's not Christianity. Christianity says, well, why don't we follow them? If Jesus is unafraid and unashamed to say that, that children will bear his name, meaning when we accept a child, we are accepting Christ. If he's saying that children are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and we need to be like them, what he's actually telling us is we should be looking at children and saying, how can we be more like them as we follow Christ? Yeah, it's sad that Barulus died. Okay, great. Lots of people died. <laughs> the important thing is Barulus was an example of faith to other people. And we live in a culture that doesn't, do that. We're not going to have an infant baptism here at this church ever, I don't think. I mean, as long as I'm here, obviously. Like, like I, told you, I feel very strongly about this. But this is what I can tell you. It, it's important that we reprioritize in our heads constantly, that we, cal we recalibrate what we see is important, what we see is valuable. How we prioritize teaching and preaching. How we prioritize what we're pouring in to other people. It's vitally important that when, when a child shows faith that we do baptize them. That we don't say, oh, wait, wait till you're older. There shouldn't be a wait till you're older. Kids shows faith, we should baptize them because that's the way it should be working. But most importantly, we should be recognizing that the image of Christ is on every child. 
And yeah, historically, we haven't cared too much about kids. But the Son of God showed up to tell us who God is. And he said, when you welcome a child, you welcome me. I don't care what I was doing. We need to value. We need to see as vitally important children to protect them, to lead them, to guide them, and yeah, sometimes to follow them. We are not the only Christians, but we are Christians only. And as Christians, that's what Jesus taught us to do. This morning, we're in our third week of our series called Not the Only Christians. As we learn from St. Barulis, and we learn from some folks I disagree with, and we learn from uh, these passages of Scripture uh, about Jesus, and man, somehow the disciples got it so very wrong when they knew what they were supposed to do and didn't. From all of that, we learn this. To welcome a child is to welcome Christ. To help a child to have faith is to honor Christ's kingdom. To welcome a child is to welcome Christ. And to help a child to have faith is to honor Christ's kingdom. This morning, the musicians are going to come forward. We're going to sing a song. We offer an invitation each and every week. And oh, yeah, it's about baptism. The Bible teaches that when we, like, well, I already said it all. So if you want to get baptized, let's talk. Like I already said it in the sermon. If you didn't hear it before, well, you should listen. That was hostile. I didn't mean for that. Second time in hostile. I don't mean for that. If you're already a first believer in Christ, you're looking for a perfect church home. I'm apparently way too hostile for that. So we do serve a perfect God. We want to connect. We want to call. We want to cultivate. We want to meet new people. We want to share the gospel. We want to grow up when we do it. And we want to be people who prioritize children and young people. We want to be uh, a congregation and a community that, that cares um, and recognizes the value of not just protecting children, but seeing the kingdom through their eyes. As we stand.